This week was a little unusual for me um, in, the, in the sense that I, I like a pretty orderly routine. I'm, I have certain days I do certain things and everything, everything works out better when I can follow my routine. But on this particular week, I had a friend who pastors a church in Mobile, Alabama, and his father had passed away, and the funeral was Thursday. And so I was doing my best to get to, uh, to that funeral, um, and uniquely how that th- the, the circumstances surrounding that ends up molding into this whole message today that's going to be out of Acts chapter 16. Um, so when it finally looked like it was going to work, and, and so Thursday morning I got ahead of the airport, and, and, and like we do in our family, um, we're, we're early. Um, my daughter not particularly, but, but Gene and I like to be early and in ordered, and so you know I beat the traffic. I beat the traffic to the airport. I got a front row parking place and short-term parking, so that tells you I, I beat a lot of people there. Quickly through, quickly through security, and I get settled in at my gate early, enjoying my breakfast of champions, my nine-dollar uh, bottle of tea and apple fritter. All right, well, welcome to airports. And so I'm just trying to enjoy my my breakfast, and an elderly gentleman gets wheeled up and left there uh, kind of in this area f- for the gate. And it was in that moment that the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you are to serve this man. Now, in light of our message series and in light of specifically last week's message um, about, you know, if not me, who? And if not Saul, you know, if Saul, then blank. You know, I'm, I was sitting on go. So I didn't have this tussle with the Holy Spirit on, no, you're asking me to do what? I'm not going to. So I was past all of that already. I went right to, well, how is this going to work? What's the process? How, how am I going to engage this, this person? And, and I noticed he had a red hat on, and it was a Marine hat. And so I said, okay. So um, I'm going to, first chance I get, then I'm going to thank him for his service and see where that goes. So I'm just sitting there, just waiting to see how this is going to play out. And he begins to reach and fiddle with his wheelchair. Um, what would look what looked like to me that he was trying to find a way to release the brake so he could move it himself. But the chair was designed that it was you had to have someone actually push it because the brake was up top. So you kind of had to pull, pull it together and then turn. So I got up and said, can, can I help you? He said, I'm trying to find the brake. I need to use the restroom. I said, well, you know what? It's up here. Um, so how about I just take you? And he said, oh, great. Well, thank you. And so, but now since post 9-11, right, you can't leave in your luggage anywhere. So I got my briefcase around my neck and I got my little carry-on bag and then I've got his wheelchair and I'm pushing him uh, one-handed. This is, it was a beautiful sight. Um, <laughs> down the concourse, you know, steering my way through finding the restroom and got to the restroom and then he came out of the restroom and he said, what well, I remember my dad saying all the time, but my, my dad said, it's no fun getting old. You know, and that was the phrase he used. It's no fun getting old. And I said, yeah, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my dad's line. And so we got back, but instead of just kind of dropping back and saying goodbye, because I believe this was God opening the door, Holy Spirit opening the door for conversation, I, I went him to the side where I was sitting and, and turned him towards me, and then that's when I got a chance to thank him for his service. Well, that turned into him telling me that he wears the Marine hat because it helps him get through security. So I, I, so I liked that. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. But, but, then, but then he said he was a veteran of World War II and actually um, was in uh, battalion command on Iwo Jima in World War II. And then he went on to say he was a battalion commander in Korea. And so he had served uh, our country in two, in two wars. Um, and, but he didn't stay long. He didn't talk long about his military service. He actually moved on to that he was visiting his daughter who had just moved um, from Nashville, Charlotte. Turns out, not, not just Nashville, but Franklin. And not just Franklin, but West Haven. So coincidence? No, there's, there's no coincidence working in this conversation. But he goes to that he lost his wife two years ago, um, and they were married 68 years. And he now starts sharing the pain and all the things, all the fun they had with one another and all the places they had been, and, um, but the pain of losing his wife. Um, and he said these words, I don't know why God took her from me. Um, so the Holy Spirit's steering this whole conversation. I, I, I am listening. I haven't said a, hardly a word yet. And then he said, I have a bishop who lives near me. I have a friend that's a bishop. And he came to see me right after my wife died. And I told the bishop I didn't want to hear any his gibberish. And um, I'm just, you know, not the time to unveil to him that I am um, <laughs> actually a bishop as well, right? So, so I kind of keep it myself and he went, on, he went on to talk that he, you know, 
believed there was a creator of God, but other than that, no real time for religion. And you couldn't see the things he saw to not believe there wasn't a God, but, you know, um, no religion for him. And, um, and then he started talking about death. Now, this gentleman was 96, he was 96 years old. And um, said, I don't know what happens after you die. I'm hoping heaven, or if it's not heaven, then it's nothing. And, you know, and I really don't, I really don't know, but I kind of hope, hope it's heaven. And then I get to see Ginger again. Those, those are just his words. And um, so when he kind of wrapped up conversation, I said, listen, um, called him by name. And I said, sir, um, I can tell that you're, you know, you're a strong man and you're a courageous man. But I also can see that you're a tender hearted man. And, um, and I said, I hope, I hope this, you can receive this. I said, but I agree with your bishop. The bishop was telling him that look at the 68 years, not, not the two she's been gone. And I called him by name and I said, um, the grace of God is a very unique thing. And I said, when we're, when we're hurting, we have a tendency to look at what's gone. But the grace of God shows us what, what we had. And, um, and I said, I need you to know today that I didn't come help you just because I wanted to or because I was nice. I helped you because God directed me to help you today. He told me when you got pu pushed up here to serve you today, and that's what I'm doing. And can I also tell you this, that you are completely known and loved by God. Well, that turns into him quoting everything from Hamlet to Socrates. Honestly, it was amazing, the, 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 his, his, his recall on believing, believing in God, believing that there is a God and that God exists. And then I was able to tell him, I said, but sir, you're wondering whether or not it's heaven or nothing, um, or you just go away. I said, the, the beauty of Christianity is that you can know for sure that we have a home in heaven. I said, every other ideology or religion that you say you don't have time for tends to try to measure if our good outweighs our bad at the end of our life, then there's some kind of paradise. But whoever knows, A, what's good or bad, and whoever knows what the score is, in Christianity, you don't worry about that because of the cross of Christ. And I helped him on the plane. I got a chance to just see him a little bit afterwards and his daughter, and she thanked me for, for helping him, and, and, uh, and I went on about I went all about my day, and then as I dig deeper into Acts chapter 16, I saw the fit. I saw how all of this was gonna, all this was gonna play out. Um, why did I go ahead and tell him that God told me? I mean, isn't that kind of one? Is it kind of brash, or, or or two? Is it kind of um, self-serving to say that God directed me to serve you today? I don't, I don't think so. Here, here's, here's why. If I just did it on my own, I never pointed to the fact that God directed me to do that then I'm the one who looks good, right? Then I'm the nice young man, that's right, young man, who, um, who, who helped this elderly gentleman, and then I get the kudos. But yet when I bring in the fact that God directed me there, then he understands that there was something bigger at work than just some generosity of another person. Scripture says that when we lift up, when Christ is lifted up, all men are drawn to him. See, it didn't do him any good just to, you know, find the kindness of a stranger. I mean, that was nice, but that wasn't going to be what was going to change anything. Um, but Christ can. And so, so it was an open door that God had prepared for me to walk into. And in religious circles, we talk about open doors and closed doors, right? And so there's two, two big ideas out of Acts chapter 16 I want to talk about. One is this idea of open doors and closed doors, okay? And the other is, who is Jesus' type? Do you know that Jesus had a type? Jesus has a type. Who is Jesus' type? So let's pick up the reading in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Say closed door. Closed door. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Closed door. Closed door, right? So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. 
Open door. Open door. So Paul and Silas, right now it's Paul and Silas, Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, and um, Luke, the author of Acts, is now traveling on this second missionary journey with Paul. And they, they would be, what I would say, is picking them up and putting them down. I mean, they're getting anywhere they can get. They're preaching the gospel of Christ. And so, I mean, the next thing in line was this province of Asia. And so Paul had in his mind, province of Asia is next. That's where we're going to go. Let's get after it. But yet the Holy Spirit says, no, not there. Closed door. Now, why would God close a door of somewhere in order to preach the gospel? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Paul didn't know. What he knew was, okay, well, not there. So there was another place that looked like it was the next logical place. So he tried to go there. But when he tried to go there, again, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit says, no, not here. Now, many times in Christian circles, any kind of opposition to where we felt directed to, we end up thinking that, okay, well, this is just a closed door, and so we move on. But whenever you're on a mission for Christ, which is our whole lives, by the way, then opposition doesn't always indicate closed doors. Sometimes it indicates just opposition. So you gotta, you got to kick through some of these doors. you got to keep moving. But, but there comes a time when you've tried to zig and you zag your way through the door, so on the door still closed. you got to recognize, okay, closed door. What's next? And so Paul is now closed door. What's next? Well, here comes what's next in a vision. So, so let me say that when God makes open doors obvious. All right? Here's the open door. Go to Macedonia. It was obvious to him. Next day they're up and they're headed that way. And the only really difference that I can tell between a closed door and an open door is when God opens a door, it means he's already been working on both sides of that door. Make sense? So open door means he's already prepared this over here, and he's preparing me so that I go through the open door to what or who he's already prepared there. So here becomes this open door. So I say that because I want you to have some courage that when a door is open, that you, you, you didn't, you're not the one who kicked it open, and you're not the one who's going to have to make it happen when you get to the other side of that. Okay, there's a, there's a process and there's a product to open doors. Our responsibility is the process. We walk through open doors. We talk about Christ. We engage people. That's a process. The product is God's part of the equation. But he takes our process and he's the one who changes hearts and minds. And we'll see that as we move forward. Um, so now Paul and Silas and Timothy and uh, Luke have walked through this open door, and they enter this town. The first, this is the first entry of the gospel into Europe, and the town is Philippi. And when they get there, they begin looking for a synagogue. Now, the reason why Paul looked to begin ministry in all these different cities and synagogues is because he looked for a place of commonality, okay? So that he knew that if he got in front of some Jews at the synagogue, that they had this basic um, overlap, if you will, because Paul understood Judaism. But Paul knew that Judaism was leading to the Messiah. So he wanted to start with a commonality in the synagogue, and then some of the Jews would receive Jesus as the Messiah, some would not, and then he would move on to the Gentiles. He would move on to those who hadn't heard anything about who Yahweh was or leading into the Messiah. So he begins looking for the synagogue, but there was no synagogue to be found in Philippi. So there had not been enough male Jews in the area. It took 10 male Jews to form a synagogue. Now, I know you came to church today, you didn't expect to learn that, right? That one's, that's, all, that's on me, right? So it took 10, took 10 male Jews, and they don't find one, but, they, but Paul goes to this river, um, and it's unique because he's, he's looking for this place of prayer. And so, he's, so in essence, what I'm thinking is he's trying to find this spiritual place in the town, a place that could have been considered spiritual or peaceful, and he finds these people at the river, and that's where we begin. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went outside, so Luke, this is Luke telling the story. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. This, this is a phrase also known, you can see it in the New Testament, as God-fearer. God-fearer, and I'll explain that in a second. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to their home 
if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she says, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now, a God-fearer would have been, a, would have been um, someone who was not Jewish, who had reacted or responded to Yahweh as the God, uh, 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 the one and only God. So this person would have seen and recognized that Yahweh was greater than all these other regional or city deities. And they began, although they weren't Jewish, they began to worship this, this God. All right, And so somewhere in Lydia's travels, Lydia comes in contact with a synagogue. She comes in contact with this Jewish faith, and she recognizes that this truly is the one and only God. And so now, in her hometown, she has formed a gathering, if you will, whether, uh, from her household and maybe some other women. And this is the first, she becomes the first convert in Europe, the first convert in this city of Philippi, and it's very interesting because in one fell swoop, what Paul does is he shatters this idea of the Roman and the Jewish world that women were not valued as men. It shatters it. The second thing it shatters is this idea of self, that someone can be self-sufficient with no need of Christ. Because Lydia, she is the mark of self-sufficient, successful women says that she's a seller of purple. I mean, she had her own business. And purple was, was a, a color of royalty or high standing. And so for her to have a business that would have probably bought fabric, dyed fabric, and then sold fabric throughout that area, she was a woman of means. She was a woman of prominence. She had made her own way. She was a self-sufficient, successful, entrepreneurial woman. And here becomes the first type that we can say is Jesus' type. Blows apart this idea of this economic division and this gender division because here's Lydia. Lydia then opens her household up to these apostles for them to hear. In the United States, we make decisions individually. Okay? Okay? And, and, and a lot of other parts of the world, especially um, the eastern part of the world, decisions are made by families, by households. And it's not that you just follow suit, but there would have been an entry point to that household. It was going to be Lydia, and Lydia opens her house so other people can receive Christ. And here becomes this first convert of the church of, of Philippi, which we would need we would, when you read the book of Philippians. Philippians is the book that Paul writes to Philippi. So there is... Um, I love the fact that Paul does his part. Here's an open door. Here are these women. But it says the Lord opened her heart to the message of the gospel. Here's what I mean about we're responsible for the process. God's responsible for the product. O only the Holy Spirit can open the heart to the message. But we've been given the charge to give the message. So... Um, Sometimes people get, you know, criticize other people how they do evangelism. I love the line that says, I'll prefer the way that I'm doing evangelism to the way you're not doing evangelism. I'll go ahead and stick with the way that I'm doing it as opposed to the way you're not doing it. Many times we don't do it because we're afraid. What, what I want you to see here is God opens doors, and then when you step in the door and you identify him, he handles the rest. Let's go to the second type of Jesus person that we find in Philippi. So you begin reading verses 16. When the own, um, no, verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at the moment, the Spirit left her. Now, when I, when I reviewed this, it rang true to the gospel. I, I, you know, there was times in the gospel we hear that demons tried to identify who Jesus was. So this kind of rings true. But I'm wondering what annoyed Paul so much, except maybe someone falling behind you everywhere you went, saying, These people are, you know, that could be annoying. The second thing probably could be annoying is the fact that I think the last person you want to be endorsed by is your enemy. Right? 
And so here's this local deity and the fortune teller from the town kind of being the, the marquee person announcing who you are. And Paul gets fed up. And look, he doesn't address her. Who does he address? The spirit. Address the spirit. Cast the spirit out of her. And here we have the second conversion that we, that's recorded in Philippi is a young slave girl, demon possessed. So we have self-sufficient, entrepreneurial, successful woman, and we blow, we blow that model right out of the water that, you know, you got to be in need, you know, you got to be poor or you got to be male, and then we blow this right out of the water. Here's a person that has no control over her life whatsoever. She has no control over her life spiritually because she's demon-possessed. She has no control over her life because she is a slave. So she does what she's told. She goes where, she, where she's supposed to go. But here becomes, here is the second convert in Philippi. Fully successful, self-sufficient woman. A young female, no control at all in her life. And we have the second kind of type, Jesus' type. Now, this one causes a great deal of uproar in the town. Because there was people who, the people who owned her made money off of her. She, so when she would tell your fortune, when she would tell the future, she would get paid for that, and that's, they got paid for that. Well, now that spirit of that local God is gone. So Paul has also demonstrated that the power of, power of Christ is greater than the power of this deity that's being worshipped all over the place. And now the, uh, the, uh, her owners bring um, Paul and Silas, bring them to the magistrate to say, these people are disrupting our way of life. Now, it's interesting. They don't say we can't make any money anymore because they freed this girl from this demon. What they say is, well, they're, they're changing our way of life. And here, here's what you find. Christianity will always be opposed because Christianity brings freedom to people that are enslaved. It, it's the only faith. It's the only ideology. It's the only religion that brings freedom. And so it's going to be opposed because it disrupts other people's way of life. Christianity will always be deemed dangerous because it frees people. Christianity is blamed for the fall of the Iron Curtain, the underground church in Russia. And I'm going to tell you that the underground church in China is a massive moving force. And when we see change in China, we're going to see it come because of the underground church in China. The reason why Christians in the Middle East are killed and martyred is because they speak words of freedom. It's amazing to me the blind eye our country turns to other ideologies, claiming them to be safe and fun and you know fine and all that and not oppressive. When other ideologists in the Middle East kill homosexuals, women can't vote, they can't drive. This is an amazing thing, but we'll embrace them under this tolerance banner, and Christianity gets thumped because Christianity is the one that brings freedom. It, 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 will, it always has happened. It will continue to happen. Christianity is dangerous, not because it's violent, because it promotes freedom. So here's what happens. Paul and Silas get beaten and arrested. Verse 25 through 34, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and, si trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, where does that come from? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Here's that third type, at least in this passage, that demonstrates who's Jesus' type. Here is a normal, working class man. He's a jailer. That's his job. He gets up every day, tends to the prisoners of the jail, tends to the guards that are over there. This is, this is his assignment. This is his lot in life. He might have wanted more. He might have wanted less, but this is where he is. Normal man, normal life. 
How in the world does he get to the position that he asks, how can I be saved? Well, it starts with Paul and Silas around midnight praying and singing praises. Now, they would have been put in stocks at the deep part of the jail. Stocks wouldn't have been something comfortable. They would have been, they would have been stretched in a manner that they could not probably have laid down or have slept very well at all. And in that moment, they didn't go to, well, if this was an open door, why am I here? They turn all that to praise and prayer. And so isn't it fascinating that when the earthquake comes and the, um, the doors are open and the chains fall off that nobody leaves? Why in the world is everybody still there? There isn't any bit of logic that could have them still there other than who are these people? Who is they praying to? Because this was kind of a miraculous thing that just happened. Why else would the jailer come and ask, how can I be saved, if not the jailer had not heard these praise, this praise and this prayer? Because it would have been astounding. Why in the world would you have been in that kind of position and offering praise and prayer to, to this God of yours if you're in this position? And the whole, the whole movement that they made, the movement of the Spirit with the, with the earthquake, then put, put the jailer, this ordinary man, in a position where he says, how can I be saved? And we find that his whole household, then he opens his household. He opens his household up. And everyone in his household receives Christ. And they're baptized. And here we have the founding of the Philippian church, the first church in Europe. The church planting team is a self-sufficient, successful, independent woman. A young slave girl recently exercised in this just normal worker running this jail. And here becomes what we might not call the dream team, but it turns out to be the dream team of the Philippian church. Amazing. Who is Jesus' type? All of us. We're all his type. And for each of us that are a follower of Christ, at some point he opened our heart to hear the message from somebody who walked through an open door. like Paul, like Silas, like Timothy, like Luke. Here are some of the things that I, I've learned from this passage. One, it's the Holy Spirit who directs our steps, and he's the one who opens hearts to freedom. I, I didn't order my steps when I spoke to this gentleman at the airport. God ordered my steps. I didn't open a door. God opened the door. My words didn't get through a, a tough exterior of a 96-year-old war vet. The Holy Spirit did. I don't know, I don't know where he is in his, in his world in a lot of different ways, but here's what I know. When I said goodbye, he made sure I knew how to contact him, and he said, I'd like to continue our conversation when I get back home. The second thing I believe this passage teaches us is that everyone is Jesus' type. And together, we're powerful in his name. You might consider yourself ordinary or maybe even extraordinary. I don't know what you consider yourself. And you can look around the room at all of our services, and we got people, we got, we're from all different parts of the country and world, and, and there, there's so much stuff that's different in our life, and, and st but we all share Christ in our life. And so that makes us a powerful unit because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ. Here's what else I learned. The volume of freedom is not drowned out by hardship. It's amplified. See, woe is me and look at me never lead anybody to Christ. Woe is me how did I find myself here? Why am I underneath such this hardship? Why is all the thing going wrong? Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? When I live in a woe is me, 
I'm never available to recognize an open door of the Holy Spirit. Many of you know that we buried Sylvia Griffin about a month ago. What made Sylvia Griffin's impact on our congregation so substantive? Because she was a worshiper even though she was fighting cancer. And on her weakest, some of her weakest times was some of the loudest she was in worship. That wasn't a woe is me. It was I am where I am. Freedom, listen, freedom that Christ brings us is not limited to our hardship or circumstance. That's not the kind of freedom. That is a very limited, one-dimensional freedom that Christ brings to us. And it's not even one that he promises, right? He says in John, in John 16, he says that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He's saying the freedom that Christianity is going to be known by is that it's not going to be limited or contained by our circumstance. And when we live in woe is me, we're not enjoying the freedom that Christ brings. Because the freedom is a future freedom. It's not limited to what's going on right now. And it's amazing that when we live in that freedom, how it frees other people. Those people in that jail and that jailer could have heard secondhand that this Paul and Silas guy preaching this stuff. And yet I wonder, I wonder if not the jailer has just seen it all, done it all. I wonder if this is just a hard exterior and interior individual by this time. Now, this is not the gospel. This is just trying to fill in some blanks. And what if it was, it was going to have to take something he had never seen before, experienced before in someone to convince him that there was something greater? And he sees in these two guys that had every reason to be woe is me. But they experienced the power of Christ. And he shows up under a grace situation that nobody, Paul said, nobody's left. No one's left. Don't take, his life would have been taken. And there's precedent, even in the Gospels we see this. Life would have been taken. And yet Paul says, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, we're, we're all here. And that was all he needed to know. How, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? We're all his type. Hard, exterior, successful, self-sufficient, have nothing, no control of anything. We're all his type. And, and what, what he has the ability to do is take all of us, all his type, all different. He has, he has the ability to take all of us and put us together for something pretty amazing called the church. First church in Europe, the Philippian church. It, it's the church when he writes in Philippians 1, and he says, I thank God every, every time I remember you. It's... In Philippians 1, 6, which is probably one of the most quoted scriptures of all the New Testament. And he says, being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Imagine you, you were the slave girl, Emily. And now it's years later. And in a gathering, you hear these words of Paul being read. That says, I'm confident of this very thing, that what began in you and that day that the demon was cast out of you will be completed. It's not done. What if you were the jailer and you heard the same verse of Scripture? Lydia didn't need anything from anybody. Needed Jesus. The Philippian church is responsible for more support for Paul than any other church that he founded. an amazing thing of what Christ can do when we walk in open doors. I don't know if the team is still around to play or not, um, but if you'll come. Where does this find you today? Where does this message find you? If you're watching online or maybe if this is the service that's archived, I don't know. And Maybe you're in a situation where um, You've been convinced that you're not, you're not anybody's type. And you're not wanted at all. And yet here in one chapter of the book of Acts, 
He covers probably all of us in the room. You're all wanted. And you may have never responded to a message of the gospel before. And yet in this moment, the Holy Spirit's doing something that you can't completely identify. And what he's doing is drawing you to receive the freedom that only he brings you. You've been looking for a way out. And your answer really is not out. It's in him. He's your answer. And when you're, win- when you're in him, the out might not matter anymore. Maybe if you're already a follower of Christ, you're just kind of on that wheel. Whether that be just doing your job, coming home, doing your job, coming home to you're just self-sufficient and I think what he wants to speak to us as a church and you as a follower of Christ is that he has a lot of open doors for us to walk into if we'll do it if we'll follow Proverbs 3 and that we'll trust in the Lord with all our heart and we'll lean not to our own understanding but in all our ways we'll acknowledge him and he will make our path straight that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of God that we'll walk with purpose, that we're willing not to draw attention to ourselves because look at me never leads anybody to Jesus. Woe is me doesn't do it, neither does look at me. But it does when we point them to Jesus. When we we take the time and an open door to hear and sense and feel what someone else has and then to insert not ourselves but insert Christ. I have found in most of my life there's more opposition to individuals than there is to the cross. But I've had people oppose me where they haven't opposed the cross. There was something about me that I did or said. They had already had their arms up because of what someone else did or said. But I haven't come across anybody that's had their arms up to grace and the cross. They might not have received it. But in those moments, the Holy Spirit opens their hearts. And we're going to reach more people when we do that. That the fact that there is a large diversified harvest field waiting is a good indication of why we need a large diversified harvest force. Have you considered that everything that has been woven into your life God has brought freedom to you and your story will bring freedom to someone else. The stuff that we would like to discount, hide, forget about. God never wastes anything. There isn't anything he can't redeem and there's not anything he won't use for the redemption of others. The enemy wants to, if he can't keep us from coming to Christ and experiencing the freedom of Christ, what he wants to do is not not to be a part of anybody else experiencing the freedom of Christ. And the way he does that is he minimizes you. You start believing the lies, the two lies, right? The, the, The general two lies he tells everybody. You're not enough, God's not enough. You buy into those lies and you're stuck. And he wants to free you from those as well. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand in that middle song. I don't know where it was. I don't know where you found it. You could have wrote it overnight, as far as I know. I don't know. But, boy, there's just something. And I may, it might have been out for the last 30 years, and I, don't, you know, I just didn't hear it. But we're going to sing that chorus specifically and, because that's where the power comes from. But first, I want you to respond to the gospel. If, if, if you've never received Christ or you have, you have walked away and it's been a long time coming, but for some reason God's brought you back into this house today, or watching online and you want to respond to the freedom of Christ I invite you to do so Jesus has already done all the heavy lifting it's a gift we just have to receive it how do you receive it you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I pray that you would open your heart and believe on the Lord for you but also for the rest of us I'd say how are you willing to walk in open doors And let's make it even more specific. 
Are you willing to walk in open doors this week? Are you willing to walk through an open door this week? Raise your hand for me. If you're willing to walk through an open door this week, God, if you open a door, I'm willing to walk through that door this week. You want to talk about a faith builder, folks? When you say, I'm willing to walk through that open door and God opens the door, it's just going to blow your mind. You're not going to go through time. Because you prayed this prayer today, okay, when we finish, then when the door opened, you don't have to go through the discussion. Is this an open door or is this not an open door? Should I do this or should I not do this? Because you've already made the decision. You're willing to do it, right? So, so now we're talking about process, right? I sat there and ate my apple fritter, waiting for God to open a door. He didn't have to convince me. Now I just had to see where he wanted me to go. And then he opened the door. So, Father, for, for all of the men and women and students in this room today, Father, Lord, we receive the freedom that you bring, even beyond our circumstance, your freedom so much deeper than that. So I pray if anyone is in this, in this room with this kind of woe is me, and I don't mean that negatively, it's just where you find yourself. You find yourself in so much pain that, that you're in woe is me. In the name of Jesus, let that break now. Let it break in the name of Jesus that you experience the kind of freedom that goes so far beyond our circumstance. And Lord, for each of us, Lord, that said, we're ready for an open door. Lord, let this be a week that you have an open door where we can share not who we are, but who you are in the name of Jesus, I pray.